Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our Monday Motivation Spotlight. My name is Leslie Kaplan. We have a very special guest today, in fact, two special guests, Kim Bash, who is going to be our first guest at the nine o'clock, and we also have Heather Dean, who's going to be joining us from 9.30 a.m. So I remind you how it works. Firstly, I remind you, too, more important and most important that this session was started in order to give exposure to Israeli businesses during a very challenging time for Am Yisrael and also to motivate us and inspire us during a super challenging time and another week of challenge for Am Yisrael, unfortunately, and it's not over yet. So that's why we get together, we come together to have some inspiration and some community. So as you know, for those of you that are regulars, what we do is if you're a business owner, you're very welcome to write your business details in the chat. Also, if you have any questions for Kim, who is our guest for the first half, and I'm going to spotlight her now so that we can see the two of us together. Good morning, Kim. Good I'll morning. In just a moment. So today we have something a little bit different because we have a double session. We're going to be ending this first part at 9.25. Then we're going to be having a five-minute break. And then we start the second half with Heather Dean at 9.30. So make sure that you stay tuned for both of them because we're going to have an amazing time also in terms of community inspiration, but certainly in terms of development and business development too. For this first half too, I remind you to please stay on mute. If you're watching the recording, good morning. And I welcome you to join us live because there's something special about joining live too. So Kim, good morning, and thank you very much for being our guest today. Kim is well known in the Anglo circle, Kim Bash, and Kim is also a co-sponsor of this series this month and next month, so thank you too to Kim. And as you all know, this is also co-hosted by ACI. Kim Bash, who is very into community and making Aliyah, she believes that there's place for every Jew in Israel to come back to Israel. And she's very into property and community. She believes that a home becomes a home when you find your right community. Up until then, it's a house with four walls, and I fully agree with her. And she took her passion in terms of community and uh, Aliyah in order to become a real estate agent. And she'll tell us a little bit about, about that, too, for over 16 years. So, Kim, good morning. Welcome. Please share with some, some, us some inspiration. Tell us about your story. And I'm going to remove my spotlight now, and the spotlight will be on you. Thank you so much, Leslie. Hi, everybody. Good morning. And it's such a, an honor to be to come onto this platform. And I just am a very big um, supporter of Leslie and what she does. And it's just so nice to be here this morning. So just a little bit about myself. For those of you who recognize the accent, same as Leslie. I'm South African. I'm actually born in a coastal town called Durban. Um, which some of you may have or may not have heard heard about, um, and grew up in a very secular um, environment. I'm the only one that is religious, um, but I have sisters in South Africa and a sister in um, London, and we have such a fantastic relationship. They've come to Israel many, many times, um, but not ready to, to leave South Africa or London just yet, haven't got there yet with them. Um, and... During my time when I was in South Africa, I was running a business called Camp Counselors USA, which I would send people to work at summer camps in America. For those Americans um, on, on here today, summer camps in America is a very big industry. And we would send counselors to work um, helping out in all the different um, school techniques. They love South Africans. So I started that business in South Africa. And that uh, took me to getting a job offer to work in New York, in Manhattan. I was working for the UJA Federation, running some of their uh, conference centers. And one of them was in Connecticut. So I would commute from Manhattan to Connecticut um, sometimes uh, three or four times a week. I would run programs for them. And I started my life in America, got my green card, and started also going to classes on the Upper West Side um, with Asia Torah. So I started going to these classes and learning. And one of the rabbis said to me, you know what, Kim, I really think that you should go to Israel. And I was like, no, I'm having such a great time um, in America. I don't think it's necessary. And they said, well, you know, you haven't had any formal Jewish education. Maybe you should just go and learn for a little bit of time. And I was a little bit hesitant. I was like, I, I don't want to be brainwashed. No, no, I'm not going. Um, 
Anyway, long story short, I ended up, somebody came up to me and said, Kim, just go away. I, I, um, I want to I wanna pay for your ticket to Israel. And I was like, oh, okay. That's a free trip to Israel. Why not? So I ended up coming on a program and I was here for three weeks. And it really did change my life. And I ended up coming back to America and um, basically getting deciding that I was going to come back to Israel and um, take another two years off to actually learn in a woman's seminary, which was a big shock to my family because they, I was living like the American dream as a South African girl going to America, getting a great job. And now I'm giving that up and coming to Israel. What was I doing? Um, so it was a very big shock to them, to my family. Uh, and I came and I was learning in Israel for about, I think it was about two years. And then I met this wonderful South African shachan, this matchmaker uh, by the name of Heather Sarota. Unfortunately, she passed away about two, two years ago. And um, she said to me, I actually had, I had been here for a while and I had an, an offer back in America and to go and work for uh, some Jewish agency in America. And this shatran had said to me, well, I've got a better proposal for you. I've got this really great guy for you to meet. And I was like, I don't know. I've been here for two years already. Maybe I'll go back. I'm not sure. Should just go out with him once. Anyway, once was enough. The, the very first time I saw my husband, I had a complete moment of clarity. Um, and I knew that this was the person I was going to marry. So I never got on that plane and my ticket was booked for 10 days after our very first date. So we dated for about three weeks. Again, my parents are absolutely freaking out at this point. How could I meet this guy after three weeks? What was I doing? Um, anyway, so we, my husband is English and uh, was also learning at Asia Torah at the time. And uh, that was 20 years ago. So we are celebrating our 20 year anniversary um, this coming June. And we have five children, Shem. I have uh, four boys and one girl, got the girl in first. Um, and we are very privileged to live in the old city. So I invite anybody around the world who's watching, or even if you live here, if you ever need a Shabbos meal, you're welcome to be in touch with me. We live about three or four minutes away from the Kotel. Um, and we do a lot of hosting. And um, over the years, we've hosted hundreds and hundreds of people. Our house is an open house. Um, I grew up like that in South Africa. My parents were very, very open-minded. My house was always, um, anybody who ever needed a place, my parents were always very, very welcoming. And that's how I grew up. And that's always how I wanted my house to be. So, and even when I lived in America, anybody coming from South Africa would sleep on our couch because the South Africans couldn't afford any hotels <laughs> to stay in. So it's always been part of, I've been very, me, I've always grown up very much accepting, doesn't matter about your background, you are always welcome. And that's my home today. And we host a lot, a lot of people. So the invitation's open to anybody who, who wants to come for a meal. Um, and then when I was, I started to work in, South, in, in, in Israel, and I was working at the time for Asia Torah, doing um, a lot of nonprofit work and helping them with fundraising and running different programs. And my parents at this time were still living in South Africa. And they used to come every time I used to have a baby. My mother used to come for six weeks. And she was always so depressed every time she left. She was like, I don't want to be a once a year grandparent. So we started the whole process of bringing my parents to, um, to Israel to make Aliyah. However, during this time, they were very much discouraged. They were told by various different parties that it wasn't good for them to make Aliyah at their age. They had certain health issues. Financially, it was going to be very stressful for them. And I encouraged them. I said, Mommy and Daddy, I'm going to take care of you. Um, I want you to come. We will take care of you. Now, for those of you who know the exchange rate in South Africa, it doesn't matter if you have a big, beautiful house. Once you sell that house, you're left with really very little money. And Israel is expensive. So I decided that I needed to change my profession. And I, instead of being um, in the nonprofit world and asking for money, it was time to make money and to be able to give money. And one of the biggest things for me has been able to help my family. So I was always very interested in properties and real estate. I had a sister who was in real estate in South Africa. She has a real estate company, Cape Town. 
And uh, my neighbor would say to me, you know, Kim, you're very good at sales. I, I, I think you should go into real estate. Like, I think I'm going to go and get my real estate license. And um, those of you who don't know, I don't speak any Hebrew. It's embarrassing. I know. But what can I do? Um, many times I've got into a taxi and they'll say to me, wow, welcome to Israel. When did you get here? And I'm like, not so long ago. Not so long ago. Um, so it's always a big joke. And people always ask me, how do you run a business and be successful in business without speaking Hebrew? And yes, it is a challenge, but I have a, a personal assistant who helps me. And Google Translate is my best friend. But yes, you can manage. But I do advise anybody who is thinking about Aliyah to, to start learning and get, get going with the all pun, even if you're far away, because it has, especially with kids, um, hasn't always been so easy. It has been challenging. Um, so... I went to do my real estate license and I did a course in English and um, everybody said to me, how are you going to pass this test? It's all in Hebrew. I don't understand how you're going to do it. So I had a little conversation with um, the man upstairs and I said, you have to help me because I have to get my parents here. So I'm happy to say I passed the real estate license. They were actually more interested in hearing the South African accent. I did an oral exam and they were more interested in my accent and where I was from than me actually knowing any of the subject material, which was too much in my favor. But I started to work for a boutique real estate company selling luxury real estate. And it was great. And I was very successful. It was amazing. But I got very, very bored because it's great selling holiday homes and luxury real estate. But at the end of the day, I really felt that my calling was to bring as many people back to Israel as possible. So I decided to leave the company that I had been with for seven years and I started my own business with the focus on bringing um, and helping people who wanted to make Aliyah um, from all over the world with all different budgets. Because I never, I never forgot that feeling of when my parents were told, you can't come, you shouldn't make Aliyah. And I was like, nobody should ever be told that. Israel is the home to every Jew. And we need to provide an opportunity and, and give people the, the opportunity to come here. And not everybody has millions of dollars to buy a property. And we need to figure out how to make this happen. So I started my series called Find Me a Community in Israel. And that was just before Corona, because already I could see that people wanted to find out different areas. It's not just Renana, it's not just Netanya, it's not just Jerusalem not just Tel Aviv. There are so many beautiful places in Israel where you can actually afford to live. So we started the series and we were showcasing all different communities over the last two or three years. We have continued it, but not as much as we did during Corona. We'd showcase different community every single, every single week where I would ask locals to come on and share their experience about living in a particular community and their challenges and the Aliyah experience. And during that time, during Corona, we had so many people who made Aliyah to the places that we were showcasing on Zoom, but they had never even been there before, which was pretty amazing. I remember walking in the street and this woman stopped me and she said to me, Kim, Kim, Kim. And I had no idea who she was. She said, I want to tell you that because of your Zoom that you did, I think it was on Pardes Hana. I can't remember where, where it was. She said, we moved and we are so, so happy. So thank you for doing that. So my focus has always been about community. And I think that when you're leaving Chutzlaretz, when you're coming from another country, where you're used to having uh, your shul, your friends, your neighbors, it's very overwhelming to pick up and leave all of that. It's your, it's your safety, it's what you feel comfortable. And one of the challenges in Israel, I think, is finding the place to fit in. Where am I gonna go? Whether you're coming as a single person, whether you're coming as a retiree, or whether you're coming as a family, just navigating the education system, which is very, very challenging. And I'm very real about it. I, I really think that you've got to have both feet in. It's like a marriage. You have to have both feet in. And there are things when you make Aliyah that are going to be uh, challenging, like any change in one's life. One of the jokes I always say with my clients is that when you make Aliyah, you can't bring the dining room table with you because, you know, your house in America, wherever it is, the, the, the size of apartments in Israel are so much smaller than your houses in, in wherever you're coming from. Um, and I remember I had um, four 
boys in one room. And at one point I had one kid sleeping on the couch because we had no more space. And eventually um, we ended up extending and being able to make our house bigger. But it was very, very challenging. What is a, um, a luxury, uh, what is a necessity in America is a luxury in Israel. So space is a luxury. And I think that when you come here, it's a reprogramming. You have to think that this is, you know, it's different. It doesn't mean it's bad. It's just different. I would never live anywhere else in the world. When the war broke out, I remember my sister from South Africa calling and saying, come back to South Africa. I'm like, joking. <laughs> have you seen what's going on in South Africa? Or my sister in England said, come back. My husband's in a British, British passport. We could go. And I was like, there's nowhere else I would rather be than in Eretz Israel. If you cannot walk around with, you know, openly being Jewish with a mug and dove around your neck or a keep on your head, I'm like, I don't know what anybody's doing in the in the place that they're living if you can't freely be a Jew. So I encourage as many people to explore the idea of Aliyah. I have a anytime anybody wants to be in touch with me to speak about it, challenges, where to go. What's happening right now is that we've been in touch with many different communities, mostly from North America and one or two from Canada, who um, their leadership, whether it's a rabbi or somebody in the community, is looking to bring um, the community, whether it's 20 families or 30 families, to come together. So one of the challenges that we're dealing with right now is where to find those opportunities, houses, where we can build. And there are, there are places we just sold 15 plots of land in Hashmonayim, which is a yeshuv just by Modin. We're working with a group now that's looking at another plot in Efrat to build. There's places in up north. The further up north you go, the further down south, then the prices get um, less expensive, more affordable. Um, but there's a lot, lot happening. They are, you know, there's a joke in Israel. You know, what's the um, the national bird of Israel? It's called the crane. Because wherever you go in Israel, you see cranes. It's unbelievable. If you're standing in Jerusalem just looking at the city center, our cranes everywhere. We are building. Unfortunately, we're not building this way. We're building up because we don't have enough land. So for those people, one of the challenges is moving into an apartment rather than into a house. Although there are housing, you know, cottages available, it just depends on where you're prepared to live and where you're prepared to go. But for those of you who want to explore communities, we have this great channel on YouTube called Find Me a Community in Israel. Um, and we've covered so many different, I think over 40 different communities. But one of the things that I am very blessed to have been given is insight into um, instinct and insight perception of people. I'm very perceptive and um, I, I can very much figure out with you where the right places are for you to live. So if you call me up and you say, Kim, this is my criteria, this is our budget, this is what we can do, then I can give you a couple of opportunities and places where I think that you will fit in depending on one's circumstance and one's budget. Um, but the market is strong right now. I would love to say that it's going down um, prices, but unfortunately they're not. It doesn't mean that you have to be discouraged. It just means that we have to be creative and you have to be willing to explore other opportunities. I didn't realize that there are so many, I'm South African, as I said before, there are so many people, Anglo, living in, in, in fantastic areas that I didn't even know about. Up in Haifa, there's a great community of Anglos. There's a community that just came from Baltimore that's living in an area called Afula, which is much more affordable than other areas. So there's definitely a place for everybody. And as Leslie mentioned, I'm very much into a house is just a house. But when you find your community, that's really when you find your home. So um, I encourage anybody who's interested you know, to be in touch with me. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, personally, my family, we are all different um, hashkafas. I have some children that are not religious. I have some are on different, um, you know, I have a daughter in Betzalel in the art academy, um, which is amazing. I have one kid in one school. I have, a, I have a kid who has dyslexia, so I can help people who have kids who have learning difficulties to help them navigate the school system. Retirees, if people want to be near the beach, there are wonderful beach communities like Naharia which is up and coming. For those people who want more of a house, there's areas like in the Golan and Katsrin and in um, uh, Kamiel. 
I just had a couple, by the way, during Corona, when people couldn't make Aliyah, they were buying real estate with me over the phone, sight unseen. Now, not everybody has the stomach to do that, um, but we did sell a lot of properties like that. And I would always be like, I really hope you like me after this. Um, we would take our, you know, WhatsApp or Zoom and I would show you, okay, this is what the floor looks like. This is what, you know, the faucets in the bathroom look like. Um, and a lot of people, I'm actually in the middle of a contract now with, with people who are desperate to come, but were unable to come and they sent their friends to visit the apartment. So there are ways to buy or rent even. Another quick thing before, I know I'm on a, a two minutes, is that for those people who are not sure where they, where they want to go, there's nothing wrong with renting in the beginning, especially if you, as I said, if you're not 100% sure. But I do encourage you to go where you have friends and family because, you know, it's it's challenging in the beginning and you need a support system. So if you have friends and family and you like each other, family, then I suggest that you actually go to where that particular family is or friends are to make it much easier in the beginning. And the rental market, though, is tough because you've got to take a rental usually as soon as they come on the market. Um, and sometimes people would take the rental even before they get here just to secure it. Um, and that's basically it. I, um, again, um, I live in the old city. You're welcome to make time to come and visit me if you're here. It's always a joke as well. I have many people, I could have made a lot of money by people knocking on my door and asking to use the bathroom. So if you find yourself in need of the bathroom, you're welcome to knock on my door. Um, it's hilarious because it's very hard to find public bathrooms in the old city. Um, so, um, Leslie, thank you so, so much for having me on. And um, reach out and come home. We are waiting for you. Absolutely. For those that are watching the recording or for those that are here in the room and are not yet living in Israel, I fully I agree with Kim, and I think there's many of us here. Yes, Israel, on the one hand, there are challenges, but I always say to people, in the old country, you had challenges too. So rather have your challenge here in Israel than have it in Kutzlaritz. And just a couple of things I want to add what Kim said. Firstly, by the way, Kim and I, when we were planning this, we discovered that we were at the same high school, and we grew up in the same area in South Africa, and we actually didn't even know each other then. You're a couple of years younger than me, but we thought that we'd know a few people in common, but it turned out that we didn't know so many from the old country, although now we do, but from the school days, we didn't. So that's the one thing I wanted to add. The other thing is, you know, when Kim, part of her slogan, and she talks about that a home becomes a home when you find your community. So I fully agree with you. There was at one stage, we were living in a place for seven years and we decided we weren't happy there anymore. And I remember me saying to my husband at the time, Baruch Hashem, I'm happily married second time round, and saying to my husband at the time, but how can we leave this place? We built this house from scratch. We designed it. We planned every single tile and everything. And we realized, and I use those exact words, that a home becomes a home, you know, when you're happy where you are. But basically it was a house with four walls and we could rebuild and replace the actual physical structure in a place that we could be happy. So, Kim, thank you so much for your words of inspiration. My I'm Israel Chai, and we wish Amen. I'm Israel better times. And Amen. I remind you that this program was brought to us from ACI and through ACI co-hosted, hosted by me, Leslie Kaplan, co-hosted by ACI, and that Kim, all of you have heard me mention her name the last couple of weeks, and now you see the Kim Bash live. Kim is a co-sponsor of our program this month and next month. So thank you so much, Kim. So Thank what you, we're going to do is, because this is a double session, firstly, I'd like to introduce our guest for next week, a really special guest. Every week we have special guests, and I know I say that every single week. The next week we have someone who I'm sure when I say her name, you're going to say, wow, i got to be here, and I hope you will be here, is Barbara Safa, who is the Israel uh, Director of Public Relations for Hadassah Women Zionist Organization. She, I brought specially for this next week is International Women's Day on March 8th, which is why our session is on March 4th. And I thought who could be the ideal person to bring on International Women's Day? And luckily she agreed to be our guest. So make sure that you stay tuned and join us uh, for, uh, for Barbara. So I'm going to now end this recording officially. Thank you once again to Kim for being our, uh, Thank you for having our me. very special guest and for sharing a bit about community and yes for the question asked you can find about her community recordings in youtube and also just google kim bash and then you'll be able to find things too so please make sure that you stay with us we have our next special guest heather who is on here i just want to officially end off 
this recording.